All right. Uh, let's keep going. Can I switch off the chat here? All right. Let's get started. Okay, so we are talking about Fourier transform. We are looking at properties of Fourier transform, and this is where we stopped in the previous class, right? This is, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. People online, are you guys able to hear me? Please use the chat box to let me know. Someone? Thank you. All right, so Fourier transform of a signal, X of T. X of t is defined as the product of m of t with a cosine at a particular frequency, omega naught. So this, you can treat it as a message. Treat as message. And treat as carrier. Why would you ever want to multiply a message with a carrier? Why, what is a carrier? Well, the simplest way to think about a message in a carrier is uh, let us suppose I wanted to throw a piece of paper somewhere. Uh, I wouldn't be able to throw it um, really far, right? So I would have to crumple it into a ball and maybe get some distance. But if I wanted to throw it really far, maybe I can put it in a um, stone, right? Wrap it around a stone and then you can throw it really far. So stone is your carrier. The, the thing that you're trying to transmit is your piece of paper, right? So you put the message on a carrier and then you transmit the modulated carrier and then you have to sort of remove the carrier and extract the message at the receiver side. So that's where we are going with uh, this particular problem. However, we are not talking about it in terms of, in the, in the complete context of communication system, we just need to look at it as a, what happens to the Fourier transform of a signal when you multiply two signals? Well, in time domain, you are multiplying them, which essentially means that in the frequency domain, you are convolving the Fourier transform of the message with the Fourier transform of a cosine, right? So for the message, I don't know it's, um, I don't know the signal in time domain, so I'm just assuming some arbitrary m of t, and I'm assuming that Fourier transform of the message to be m cap m of omega, and I'm assuming that to be a triangle, and it is band limited to ne negative w to w. Quick question. What is the shape of the signal in time domain? What is the shape of the message in the time domain? Sphinx squared. Right, so it looks something like this in the time domain, Sphinx squared. Um, but that's not too relevant. I just wanted to ask that question. All right, so you have this m of omega getting multiplied with a cosine. In the time domain, it's getting multiplied. In the, in the frequency domain, what are you doing? You are, Fourier transform of the message is supposed to be like that, just an assumption. The Fourier transform of a cosine is this, two impulses, one at omega naught, one at negative omega naught with a weight of pi. When this gets convolved with this guy, what do you get? You get frequency shifts. This guy is gonna shift over here, and this guy is gonna shift over here, right? So you're gonna get something like this. Remember, what are you doing? You are doing this. You are doing, let me write down, m of t multiplied with cosine omega naught t, and in the Fourier domain, or the frequency domain, you are doing this, one divided by two pi, cap m of omega, involved with pi, an impulse at negative, not 10, negative omega naught plus delta omega plus omega naught, right? That's what you are doing here. Uh, and as you can notice, this pi gets ca canceled with this pi. So you're left with half m shifted to omega naught, half m shifted to plus omega naught, right? So you got that. Let's color code it. This with the two and with the minus is here. Right? And for the other part, you're getting it here. So this is called up converting my message. Because you see this, my message was at 
baseband baseband in terms of its frequencies right it was all the way down to zero that is message at baseband and i what i did by multiplying it with the cosine carrier is i up converted my message to pass band you guys have heard these terms in circuits yep so that's what we did here we have up converted converted to pass band now because we know the frequency of the carrier signal omega naught we know that center frequency and because we know the bandwidth of my our message we know the width of the triangles as well half goes here half goes there so that would that that's what your x of t in frequency domain looks like right x of t in the frequency domain looks like two triangles that are at plus omega naught and minus omega naught each of them have a width of two times w good solution of the which one yeah yeah it is right so it's a cosine one frequency uh, i've got a frequency at omega naught and a frequency at negative omega naught because x cosine is a real signal so you got the hermitian symmetry with the uh, the frequencies so one one frequency you're going to have an impulse is that, is that so even for sine you're going to get like tones in the frequency domain those are going to be impulses their phases are not going to be similar to the ones in the cosine so you you multiply those two you get x and you are looking at this is what this is our uh, fourier transform of x of t right that's what it is so this is essentially a recap of what we just de described 1 over 2 pi m of omega is over here we are convolving in the frequency domain with the two impulses of the cosine we get half amplitude centered at negative omega naught half amplitude of the triangle at plus omega naught so that is the signal at pass band it has been up converted it has been modulated by the carrier uh, sorry the message the carrier has been modulated by the message now the next question is what is going to happen when you take this x of t and you multiply it with the cosine signal again right so something like this x of t is m of t cosine what happens when you multiply with another cosine so you get what m of t cosine squared what would be the fourier transform of m of t multiplied by a cosine squared look like well m of t cosine look like this right and now you are trying to convolve this guy with this guy again while including the factor of 1 over 2 pi you guys see that so what you are after is 1 over 2 pi x of omega convolved with again the pi delta of omega minus omega naught plus delta of omega plus omega naught right that's for the second cosine you see that again what is going to happen the pi is going to get cancelled here half of it is going to happen at x of omega minus omega naught right so i can say this is going to be what half x of omega minus omega naught plus half x of omega plus omega naught yeah so what is going to happen here this guy if you just look at the first triangle here it is going to go up by omega naught and down by omega naught and the same thing is going to happen to this guy this guy is going to move up by omega naught and down by omega naught there you're going to get a double right so you're going to get two triangles here which are going to meet at zero right so this is going to be like that what is going to be the width well the width of your message w right so that is going to be at zero here this is going to be w this is going to be negative w and the height is going to be half 
Why is it going to be half? Well, if you look at this, this was half amplitude. One fourth of it goes, went here, one fourth of it went here, and you got another one fourth from here. So one fourth, one fourth add up half, right? So you got half over there. But the, then you are going to get two more triangles. One is going to be over here, and the other is going to be over here. Yeah? So what is the center frequency in this case and in this case? This is going to be two omega naught. This is going to be negative two omega naught. The widths are all going to be two W, right? And here and here. The height, this is going to be one fourth and this is going to be one fourth. You guys see that? So you have modulated the carrier. Say you have transmitted it and at the receiver, if you want to get back your original signal, all you have to do is multiply by the same cosine again. And if you do that, you down convert the signal to baseband. All that is left is to reject this guy and this guy. What can you do to reject this and this? Low pass filter. What is the cutoff frequency of my low pass filter? Uh, has to be W. Can I be more than W? Okay. How how big how big compared to W can I be? So it has to be. So let's see. Let me call this omega f. The cutoff frequency of my low pass filter. This guy has to be chosen such that it is greater than W, because it has to let the message go through. But it has to be less than what? It has to be less than two omega naught minus W, right? This edge right here. You see that? So omega f, you have some choice there. So I'm drawing a ideal low pass filter. Now, if I wanted it to be exactly matching the message, what I can do is I can make the gain of my low pass filter go to two, so that when it multiplies with half, I get back exactly what my message is. You see that? So when I'm filtering, what am I doing in a uh, uh, frequency domain? Am I multiplying in frequency? Yeah, exactly that, right? When I'm filtering, I'm multiplying it, it in the frequency domain. I'm multiplying uh, three triangles with a rectangle in the frequency domain, so as to reject the double frequency terms. So if I'm multiplying in the frequency, what am I doing in time? I'm convolving m of t multiplied by cosine squared omega naught t with what? With a sink, right? You guys see that? Yeah? So that's our, our uh, sort of a preliminary discussion that is going to lead us into lecture number 14, which is communication systems. So, so far we have looked at several different tools that make up our toolbox, a screwdriver and a pliers and all that. Now we are going to talk application. The first application that we are going to look at for this class is communication systems. So how can you use the conversation of convolution and Fourier series and Fourier transform and representing signals in different ways? All of that for the sake of communication systems. So let's see, when you think about communication systems, what are you trying to do? Communication systems, what, 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 what what is your, um, what are the things that come to your mind? Send message, receive message, right? So receive, re reception of my message. Research of, re how? Good, bad, good reception, bad reception. So reception of the message, reception of transmitted message, transmitted signal, which hopefully is error free, right? Error free reception. That's one. What are some of the other things that come to mind? Error free transmission. Can my trans, uh, can my uh, communication be slow? What? Fast. Data rate, right? So the data rate has to be really good, right? Uh, data rate. High data rate. How can I get high data rate? I can get a high data rate if I increase the bandwidth of my signal. Instead of going up to W, I go to 2W. I have increased the bandwidth of my signal. So bandwidth. 
Who controls the bandwidth? FCC, Federal Communications Commission, right? So FCC license has some license band, has some unlicensed band. Certain bands of frequencies are really good for atmospheric absorption. They, when I say good, the absorption is less, right? So uh, certain other frequencies, they, their atmospheric absorption is really poor. And you guys can go to Google, type in FCC atmospheric absorption of frequencies, and we'll show you all the different frequencies and how they perform under uh, different uh, weather conditions even, whether they are licensed or not. So all of that is controlled by FCC. So internet service providers like Sprint and Verizon, all of these guys need to pay a lot of money to FCC to get a slice of the spectrum, the bandwidth. So what do you want to do with that? Well, because it is very, very expensive resource, you want to make the best use out of it, right? Like you want to use that given amount of bandwidth to send as, as much data as possible. And because you want it to be fast, uh, the bandwidth is what is controlling how fast it can be. Next, uh, what, what else? Reception of the signal, data rate, what, what else? In order for the reception of my signal to be error-free, two things can be managed. One is, I can make sure that the error never occurs, or the second thing is, if the error happens, I should be able to correct it, right? So error, the chances of error not happening, that is controlled by what aspect of communication? Coding is one, okay? So coding is good, coding is one. Interference, all of those things are related to what? Signal to noise ratio, right? Or signal to power noise ratio. So my signal power, if it is high, that means I'm yelling louder and louder, right? Like you guys are going to be able to hear me more and more. So I can increase signal power for the same noise power. I can increase signal power. And if I do that, I will be able to have a lower bit error rate. So I can do this to decrease my bit error rate. So instead of having a bit error rate of 10 to the negative 3, I can go down to 10 to the negative 6, 10 to the negative 12. I can keep going down, right? One error in 1,000 bits, one error in a million bits, and, and so on. And I do that by increasing signal-to-noise ratio. One way of doing sig increasing signal-to-noise ratio is increase signal power, or the one that you try before that is what? Reduce noise power, right? So the way you, have, you can reduce noise power is by using coding techniques or by improving the quality of my channel. Anything that you add to your channel between the transmitter and the receiver, there are many things, right? There are channels in there, there are amplifiers, there are filters, there are digital processing elements. Whatever you add to your channel, you are adding some noise to your channel even like a little screw that you add, that will add a little bit of noise. Thermal noise is going to exist everywhere. Uh, so what you want to do is, you want to still get a really high data rate, but you want to have very few elements, because each element that you add, it is going to have certain noise figure, and you are going to have to deal with that. Uh, so increase signal power or reduce noise power. Noise power can go down, but it will hit an wall. You will hit a wall of thermal limit. You, of course, don't want to take your cell phone into a freezer and talk from there, right? Like you, you want to, there's a limit to how low it can go. But that is controlling bit error rate. Now, bit error rate, it has a problem. If it goes so low, how are you going to be able to manage it, right? So one of the things that you have to do is, suppose you wanted to find out how good your channel is. And it just so happens that it is really, really good. And you're getting an error one in, say, 10 to the 15 bits. How are you going to measure that? How are you going to quantify that? Well, are you going to send 10 to the 15 bits? And you have to do this as an average, right? So you're probably sending 10 to the 20 bits and looking at how many errors. So you're waiting for a very, very long time for the error to happen. Instead, what do you do? You load the um, channel with noise. So you, you, you introduce controlled amount of noise, and then your error is happening much faster. Then you can calculate 
uh, what is your actual bit error rate? Because the amount of noise that you're introducing is called noise loading technique. Uh, that's what, how you deal with a really, really low uh, bit error rate. So coding techniques are one. With coding techniques, you can also get forward error correction, right? So even if errors happen, you can, you can correct those. Uh, data rate, all right. So let's see how all of these is, are related, uh, but in terms of antenna uh, size. So let us say antenna size or length, frequency that you are using for communication and range. Right? So let us see these three aspects. How are they related? Now, frequency of operation. You can have microwave or RF communication. You can have optical communication. Right? So RF communication with microwave frequencies, that was lower carrier frequencies. When you went to optical, when you were using light frequencies, you were hundreds of terahertz, right? Which frequencies are better? If you want really high data rate, are you high, right? So if you, are, you, if you want to have a high data rate, you want to use a carrier frequency that is also very high. Uh, so that's frequency. How is frequency related to antenna size? So suppose you wanted to transmit really high frequencies. Are you, uh, is your antenna going to be longer or shorter? What is the With fields and waves, I think background, you get this. Right. So antenna should be shorter as your frequency increases, right? Half wavelength or quarter wavelength antennas. So that is why you have cell phones, you hardly see the, the antenna. You don't see big antenna, right? Why is that? The, high, the frequency is high. Why did you want the frequency to be high? Because you wanted the high data rate. So high data rate, all right, so all of this is good news, right? So small antenna, high frequencies, so all of this is really good. What is that? The range, right? So the range gets into trouble. So the, the range is a problem when you go to high frequencies. The lower frequencies will go, will travel a longer distance. As you increase the frequency of operation, that will come down. So what do you do? You use repeaters, right? So you, you, you have to have some, that's why you see cell, those cell towers. Uh, if you're using like an optical channel to communicate, you have a repeater every 80 kilometers where you are regenerating the zeros and ones. You're regenerating the signal over there. I, I I didn't hear what you said. Basically, the 5G signal tower basically has to be like in the visible range. Line of sight. Yeah. Right. That's because the center frequency is 60 gig, right? 60 gig, 70 gig. Yeah. So the higher you are going in that, Oh, by the way, 60 gig, 70 gig, it also has like an atmospheric absorption that's not great. Right, yeah. So uh, you, you would need line of sight communication for that to, 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 to take place. So antenna size, frequency, and the range over which you can communicate, these are all interrelated. Um, now, you could, um, so that, that's what you have, right? Like if you want really high frequencies, uh, because you are after data rate, then you have you can have a low, smaller antenna size, but the range get Im impacted. So you can overcome that by using repeaters between your point A and point B. All right. So these are some of the ideas that are related to the communication systems. Today, uh, whatever you hear will be relevant to amplitude modulation. So you are essentially changing the amplitude of your car carrier depending on the message signal. If you like what you hear and you're interested, I would highly recommend that you take ECSE 4520. That this is a class for which obviously signals is a prereq and probability is a prereq most likely. Um, and we'll start in the fall. So if you're interested, you, you take that as your uh, elective. Okay, let's move on. Signal transmission, and we are looking at it uh, as a bare bones system right now. You have very, very few elements between what you're transmitting and what you're receiving at the end. 
This is for microwave frequencies, which are in the range 200 meg to 300 gig. That's what, that's the frequency of the carrier that we are choosing as the RF carrier. And what are you modulating it with? You're modulating it with your voice signal, which goes from 200 gig, uh, 200 hertz to four kilohertz. Even though you can hear up to 20 kilohertz, when you speak, four kilohertz captures uh, almost all of human voice that is spoken. Next, how are you doing the modulation? M of T is your modulating signal, which we are calling the message that we'd like to transmit. Maybe you captured that from a microphone, right? So you used a microphone to capture this uh, continuous signal. We have not digitized it, it's still a continuous signal. And then you are using a product multiplier or analog multiplier here, analog multiplier, to multiply the modulating signal with a carrier signal, C of T. Now this could be like a cosine signal, cosine uh, say omega CT, or it could be E to the J omega CT, it could be complex, whatever the case. It is a periodic signal that is coming from a local oscillator. So what you can do is at the transmitter side, you can use a function generator that generates a particular frequency, only one frequency, and you can use that as your uh, carrier. What are you doing? You're multiplying them. When you're multiplying them, you're essentially doing an amplitude modulation. We'll uh, elaborate on this on the next slide. You multiply and then you use the transmit antenna to transmit your modulated signal. At the receiver, you may get very close to S, right? Maybe you get S hat of T, right? Because of the wireless channel, you may have uh, had some noise, some interference, some distortion has taken place, and instead of getting S of T, you got S hat of T. How do you get the message back? M of T needs to come back to me. So what do you do? We just saw an example where you multiply with another cosine, C of T, which is coming from, which is another periodic signal, again, cosine omega CT or E to the J omega CT. Uh, you have another analog multiplier here to get M of T, but because this guy was M of T multiplied by C of T, you're multiplying with C of T again, so you get M of T C squared of T. So this is something like in frequency, you got a big triangle in the middle and two triangles at double frequency terms. And then you use a low pass filter to chop off the things that are at two omega naught and minus two omega naught by uh, appropriately choosing the cutoff frequency of your low pass filter, omega f, minus omega f. And then you can use the height of this filter to adjust for the, the loss in the, in the amplitude. What you get out, out of the low pass filter is V sub O of T. And you're hoping that if everything goes well, this is very, very close to the message signal that you wanted to transmit. Right? So you see, you took the message at baseband, you multiplied it by the carrier to get the modulated signal, you transmitted the modulated signal, because of the channel, some problems happened, some distortion of the signal happened, but to recover it, you multiplied it with the same carrier again, down converting it, then you use the low pass filter to reject the double frequency terms, to get back your message. Hopefully, this M of T matches this very, very closely. That would mean that this channel did not introduce too much of a problem. Can you see that? Now, what we have done is amplitude modulation. What is amplitude modulation? You are changing the carrier amplitude. What are some of the aspects that you could have changed? You could have changed the amplitude of the carrier, right? You could have changed the frequency of the carrier, or you could have changed the phase of the carrier. You could have changed any one of those three things to modulate a message. Good. Why is the carrier signal what? Oh, so it is the signal that is going to carry our information from one place to the other, right? So our baseband voice, if base, so here, if I just stand here and scream, I'm not going to be able to reach 
your cell phone, right? There's a particular process that needs to happen in order for you to get the information to your cell phone. One, I'll not be able to go for a very high data rate. I'm gonna cut out at four kilohertz. You are probably not interested in four kilohertz. You are interested in megabits per second, gigabits per second, right? Like really, really high data rate. You cannot achieve that with, uh, with uh, baseband transmission. What you need to do is passband transmission. So you upconvert that uh, signal to a higher frequency. How can you do that? Well, you have to use a carrier that is at that high frequency. That's why we are leveraging microwave frequencies. These are your frequencies that will be chosen as the frequency for the modulating signal. Uh, sorry, the carrier signal, C of T. Good. Oh, no, no, no. This is just amplitude modulation. Right, but in communication in general, uh, all right, so here, let's see. Uh, let me have like a short discussion on this. Suppose I'm trying to do amplitude modulation, right? So if I'm doing amplitude modulation and say this is my carrier, right? My carrier is going to have, it's a cosine signal, so it's gonna have constant amplitude, right? If I'm doing amplitude modulation, then I'm changing the amplitude of the signal. So I'm changing the amplitude of the signal. I'm not changing the frequency, I'm just changing the amplitude. But if I'm doing frequency modulation, then I'm changing the frequency. Keeping the same amplitude, I'm just changing the frequency of the carrier. If I'm changing phase, phase modulation can also happen. If I'm changing phase, then I'm doing, like I'm changing the phase of the signal. Right, so you can do AM, FM, PM, you can, do any of the, these. And these are for all for analog. There is another thing that happens for digital, right? So in digital, what do you have? Zeros and ones need to be modulated. So maybe if it's a zero and a one and a zero, right, for binary communication, then you have one frequency going here and another frequency going here and another frequency going here, or a signal with phase of zero and a signal with a phase of pi and so on only two different phases, zero pi, zero pi, or plus or minus pi over two and so on. So three different things that you can change. Over here today, we'll be looking at amplitude, changing of a carrier, go ahead. The carrier signal in, no, doesn't have any, there are two independent signals. So M of T and C of T are completely independent. M of T is my voice, C of T is coming from a function generator, a local oscillator that produces a particular frequency, only one frequency, a cosine, right? And that cosine has to belong to microwave frequencies in that range in order for RF communication to happen. Right, so that, 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 is, your, that is setting up your carrier frequency. This is completely independent, whatever I say, whatever my message is, right? So, this is, the, my voice is going to control that triangle. How wide is it, right? And then microwave frequencies are going to control when you modulate it, upconvert it, where does that triangle go to? How far up in frequency does it go to? Now, the, the one problem that I hope some of you have started thinking about is, there is a C of T in my transmitter, and there is a C of T in my receiver. How are we going to manage that? Right, so there's a, there's a particular signal that is being used as a carrier signal in my transmitter. The same signal has to be used in my receiver. How are you going to do that? Well, what's that? Tuning, so here, before we do tuning, uh, what is one aspect of a carrier signal? It's a periodic signal, right? So what do you want to know about it? Frequency, that's all you need, right? If I tell you the frequency, you're done. But the, there's a problem. If I tell you, hey, my carrier signal is one kilohertz. Sure, you will be able to, no matter where you are on Earth, where, no matter where you are as your receiver, you will be able to generate a one kilohertz cosine. No problem. Problem is what? Phase. Where does it start, right? No, 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 but oh, you can use phase lock loop 
to synchronize. You can use a lot of techniques to synchronize the phase, even in analog world and even in digital, which is phase lock loops, right? You can have digital phase lock loop, you can have analog phase lock loop. So phase synchronization is a, is, uh, matters a lot, is what I'm trying to say. If you don't synchronize the phase, if the frequency is the same, that means what? How far apart are my fingers is the same, right? So it's easy to generate another copy of this at my receiver. But are they matching in phase or are they not matching in phase? That is going to be the problem. And it turns out if there is a phase difference of pi over two radians between the carrier signal, the local oscillator you use at transmitter versus the local oscillator you use at the receiver, you get zero message. Right, it completely cancels out. So that's something that we are going to look at as well in phase synchronization, which is, uh, which can be solved using phase lock loops. Again, a part of ECSE 4520 if you're interested. All right, so amplitude modulation is what? Inserting information onto a high frequency carrier used for transmission. So you put it onto the carrier, you transmit it. Now you're at the receiver, what do you do? You demodulate it. And the way you're demodulating it in this case, you're doing a synchronous detection because you're using another copy of the local, local oscillator. An example of asynchronous detection would be like an envelope detection. You guys see envelope detection somewhere? How do you detect an envelope of a signal? Diode, right? So you use a diode and RC filter, like an envelope detector. What is that? Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at it. That would be asynchronous detection. This is synchronous detection because of the presence of local oscillator at the receiver performs much better than asynchronous, but you need to have something like a phase lock loop, which will make the receiver expensive. Uh, next, if you modulated a carrier at the transmitter, you have to demodulate it to get it back, right? So how, what is amplitude demodulation? It is extracting the information from the high frequency carrier. And you're doing it in two steps. One, doing a product with the same C of T again, and then, followed by the low pass filter. All right, other questions here? Uh, these, are, these are very, very basic ideas in communication, right? Like the, a lot of the things are being ignored right now. Amplifiers, many, many amplifiers will exist uh, between what, in what we are talking about. Just, this is just the basics to do amplitude modulation. All right, let's do look at the time domain view of signals. This is the transmitter that I have M of T, my message signal, is getting multiplied with a cosine signal here to get M of T multiplied by a cosine omega CT signal, and that's what I'm feeding into an antenna to transmit. What is the time domain view of this? I'm choosing this to be my M of T, some message, a slow changing message. In comparison to what is it slow? In comparison with the carrier, is it slow? My carrier, C of T, arbitrarily chosen to be, uh, in this case, negative sign, uh, but it's a carrier which is periodic, right? The green guy. When you multiply these two guys, in time, how does it look like? In time, it looks like this. You see what happened here. The frequency of the carrier did not change. The amplitude of the carrier got modulated depending on the message signal. Right? So when you take a message signal and you multiply it with a cosine, you get, that's what happens to it. Now, one question I would like to ask you is this. What would happen if the message signal went, went below zero? What would happen then? So over here, all of M of, M of T is above zero, right? Which is why this is clean M of T there, and then the flipped version of M of T over there. Go ahead. Flipped, yes. You would have a phase reversal. So when you have this go down to zero, then your frequency will, will change phase when that phase reversal happens. So, and it'll happen, the phase reversal happens twice in that case. Amplitude modulation, you do not want that to happen in the case that you use asynchronous detection. So if you want to use that diode followed by an RC filter, a really inexpensive detection technique, then you cannot have phase reversal in there. If you're using synchronous detection, if you're using a local oscillator, you can keep going with it, no problem. You will be able to uh, de demodulate the signal and get the message out. But that is something that you have to worry about, especially uh, when you are using asynchronous detection. Talk more about that, because you will be tracking 
the envelope of the signal. So, message, slow. Carrier, fast, periodic, Con same amplitude. The amplitude of the carrier got modulated based on the message signal. Higher the message, higher the amplitude. Lower the message, lower the amplitude, and so on. Right? So, the amplitude of the carrier got modulated by because of that. Next. We are continuing with analyzing things in time domain. We just did that for this guy over here, S of T, right? M multiplied by C, you got S. That's what you transmit. You have your receive antenna. You get some version of S of T, maybe as close to S of T as you can. The way you demodulate it is down convert by multiplying by another cosine, get two copies at two omega naught and minus two omega naught, and then you get two triangles at the baseband, which can be filtered out using the low pass filter. The cutoff frequency omega f, we know how we, we should choose that, right? It should be chosen such that it is very small compared to two omega naught, but it should be high enough to get the message through. Let us try to look at this in terms of the background math, not in frequency domain, but in time domain. So what you are starting off with is V of T. Where is V of T? V of T is right here. In your receiver, immediately after the multiplier. So V of T is what? S multiplied by C, right? So you've got S multiplied by C. What is S? S is M times cosine. So S multiplied by C will give you what? M of T multiplied by cosine squared, omega CT. Omega C is being used as your carrier frequency in radians per second. This identity I want you guys to be very comfortable with. Cosine squared x equals 1 plus 2 cosine x divided by 2. Trig identity which will be used uh, many times here. M of t remains as is. You have just used the trig identity to write cosine squared as 1 plus cos 2 omega ct divided by 2. Now when you multiply this out, what do you get? m of t divided by 2 plus m of t multiplied by cosine omega ct divided by 2 over here as well. Remember, we are trying to demodulate the message, right? And what are we after? We are after m of t, right? So all I need is this guy. I can get rid of this 2 by amplifying it by a factor of 2. So I can increase the low pass filter gain. All I need is to reject this. How the way I reject this is by using a low pass filter right there. But if I wanted to find out V O of T in time domain, what do I need to do? In time domain, I need to do convolution of what and what. V of T, the input to the filter with the impulse response of this guy. The impulse response of this guy is going to look like a sink, right? It's a triangle, a rectangle here. So it's going to look like a sink. So I need to take V of T, which is this guy, and I need to do time domain convolution with a sink. All right, let's see what is that going to look like. Whoa, right? So all of this is what? All of this is V of T. And you're convolving it with a sink. So the sink is right here. That's your time domain, continuous time domain convolution integral. And you can, I hope you agree that this is going to be very messy. Doing this in the time domain is going to be very messy. Uh, just a quick note that omega f, this frequency, should be so chosen such a way that all the frequencies of m of t should go through, but two omega ct terms should not get through. And so you have a choice with the cutoff filter of the uh, cutoff filter of the low pass filter. Let's see. So if time domain analysis is not going to work. You're going to rely on frequency domain analysis. I will just uh, take a couple of seconds here if you guys are taking that down. X of tau, H of t minus tau, d tau. That's exactly what we have written. We have also used the standard Fourier transform pair of a rectangle and a sink. Actually, we have used the dual of that, right? Because the rectangle was in frequency. So you've used the dual there. 
OK. Let's look at it in terms of frequency domain analysis, because it's going to be much easier to work in frequency domain in this case. So in the transmitter, what do you have? M of t getting multiplied by cosine, uh, sorry, some periodic carrier, and then you transmit. So because I'm working in frequency domain, I'm going to need to know M of omega, right? The free Fourier transform of my message, of my voice, M of omega. And I'm doing a multiplication in time, which means I'm convolving in frequency, right? I'm con convolving in frequency with what? C of omega consists of delta functions. Do you guys agree with that? What is C of t? C of t is cosine, right? It's a periodic signal. So what is it going to have? Uh, all right. So a, a periodic signal is going to be having a periodic impulse strain, right? So it's going to have an impulse strain because uh, Fourier transform of an impulse strain is an impulse strain. We looked at that special case. So we, we are going to prove it again, but uh, I hope at this point you, you guys are comfortable with, with that idea that because C of omega is, uh, because C of t is one tone and periodic is going to have an impulse strain. Uh, so it's going to have, in C of omega, the Fourier transform of that periodic signal is going to consist of a bunch of delta functions. When you multiply in time domain, you are convolving m of omega with a bunch of delta functions. So what is happening in the frequency? It's all frequency shifts, right? So if you have de delta functions here, here, and here in frequency, you're convolving with m of omega, m of omega will appear here, m of omega will appear here, and here, and so on. So that will just uh, result in frequency shifts for m of omega. So let's see, the transmitted signal is being called S of t. So in frequency domain, I'm calling it cap S of omega. Cap S of omega is Fourier transform of small s of t. Small s of t is m of t multiplied by c of t. If you're multiplying in time domain, you're doing a convolution in frequency with an additional factor of one over two pi. This was our time multiplication property of Fourier transforms that we looked at in the previous lecture. So convolution with impulse functions, we will see in the next slide, it results in frequency shifts. Let's take a look. If C of t is periodic, then the claim is that cap C of omega, its Fourier transform, will be consisting of delta functions. C of t is periodic, which means that C of t can be represented by a exponential Fourier series, exactly in this manner, aka e to the j omega t dt, uh, sorry, summation, so no dt summation over all k, a k e to the j k omega naught t. This is representing a periodic signal using exponential Fourier series. If you want c of omega, then you're after the Fourier transform of this guy, c of t. That, that means that you're after the Fourier transform of this summation. You can, because the Fourier transform is essentially integrating out time, you can bring the Fourier transform operator inside, leave out a k, which are constants as far as uh, Fourier transform is concerned. So all you are left with is summation over all k, Fourier series coefficients, Fourier transform of e to the j omega naught t. And we know what the Fourier transform is for e to the j omega naught t by using the frequency shift property. Fourier transform of one constant is two pi delta of omega. If you multiply the one with e to the j omega k omega naught t in time domain, that corresponds to a frequency shift, omega minus k omega naught, because you are multiplying with e to the j k omega naught t. That is using the frequency shift property. All right, so all you have is what? The summation is over here, the a k is over here, and all of this will give you two pi will come out of the summation, you will be left with the delta function. So all of this to say that if C of t is periodic, then C of omega will be having a bunch of uh, delta functions. You can consider all of this the proof of this guy. Uh, this is Fourier transform properties right here. Mm, somewhere here it will be there. Right here. Right? 
the Fourier transform of periodic signals. This is in your table. All right, coming back. So C of omega only has delta functions. And AK, that is going to be essentially what type of period, is, what type of signal is it? Is it a cosine, is it a rectangle, what, what is it? But if it is periodic, it'll have a bunch of delta functions. Next, convolution with um, delta functions is going to result in frequency shifts. Suppose, that's what we are trying to prove here. If you have a signal x that you are convolving with delta of omega minus omega naught, that x will simply shift to the center frequency omega naught. How do you prove this? Well, let's start with x of omega convolved with y of omega. You are convolving in a frequency domain here. What is that? You can represent that using a convolution integral, x of theta, y of omega minus theta, d, d theta. If you have x of omega con convolved with y of omega minus omega naught, then you have a omega minus omega naught over here. That is the only change. Instead of y, you use the delta function. If you have a delta function over there, you just you replace y with delta function over here. If you do that, this delta function is going to only be valid when omega equals omega naught plus theta, uh, minus theta, right? So omega minus omega naught minus theta should be equal to zero, which means that theta should equal omega minus omega naught. That's the only time it is valid, which means because I'm multiplying with a function that depends on theta, I need to evaluate that function at omega minus omega naught and then integrate it. And when I do, the impulse will be included in that and will go to one. So omega minus omega naught goes there. You have X being evaluated at that. Delta in, uh, remains as is. This guy now doesn't depend on theta, so you can pull it out of the integral. The integral will only be over delta, and because it is from negative infinity to infinity, it will include the delta, gives you one, you're left with X of omega minus omega naught. All of this to say that when you take a Fourier transform of a signal and convolve it with an impulse at a particular frequency, you move that spectrum to that frequency. You move the entire X to that frequency wherever that impulse is. So let's take a look at the transmission in frequency domain. We are doing amplitude modulation, which means that we are changing the amplitude of the carrier depending on the modulating signal. M of t getting multiplied by, in this case, cosine 10t, right? So it's a periodic signal with a frequency of, radian frequency of 10 radians per second. You're multiplying them and then you're transmitting M of t multiplied by cosine 10t. Cos for M of t multiplied by cosine 10t, I can say, in time domain, they're getting multiplied. So in frequency, you have one over two pi F of M of omega convolved with the cosine at 10. So pi times delta of omega minus 10 plus delta of omega plus 10. This pi gets canceled with this pi, you will left, be left with half, but M of omega convolved with delta of omega minus 10, we just saw that it shifts over there. So M of omega minus 10 here, M of omega plus 10 over here. Let's view this by taking a look at all the Fourier transforms. So we are assuming that our message signal is a sync squared signal. M of omega then is assumed to be a triangle. And we are convolving uh, in frequency, M of omega with a cosine signal. So cosine, the Fourier transform is two impulses with a weight of pi at plus 10 and minus 10. And when you con convolve them, this guy moves here, giving you this, and this guy moves here, giving you that. Center frequencies are plus 10 and minus 10, and the width is what? Two, so nine to 11 over here, negative 11 to negative nine over here. All of these are in radians per second. So that's your, and the amplitude goes to half because of this half over here and half over here. This is called what? This process is called up conversion of the message or modulating a carrier, going from baseband to passband, many different names. Now, what is happening at the demodulation side? Well, at the demodulation side, multiplying it by the same cosine here, cosine 10t, followed by a low pass filter whose frequency is chosen to exactly match the bandwidth of the message. 
negative one to one, exactly matching the bandwidth of the message. We did not need that to be that tight, but we are. It's an ideal low pass filter discussion here. Uh, so this is demodulation is what? Extracting the message from the modulated signal. We got this at the, our receiver, right? Two triangles at plus and minus 10 with an amplitude of half. We multiplied it with the cosine carrier here. With the cosine is two impulses at 10 and minus 10 with a weight of pi. When you convert this, you see this guy gets convolved with this and comes here and here, right? This with this gives you here and here. Similarly, this guy, when it convolves with this, frequency shifts here frequency shifts here. Because you got two triangles superimposed on each other, you got half here, one fourth here, one fourth here. Twice the frequency terms over here and here, 20 and minus 20. You, we have seen this example before. Now, when you have this low pass filter, which lets frequencies between negative one and one radians per second go through, with an amplitude of two, you see this amplitude of two. So because of that two, this half becomes a one. And then you're letting the message go through. So you're essentially stopping everything out here and out here, you're, you're removing that. You're just allowing this to go through. This is exactly matching your message, which means that this is successful transmission. So questions about this example. So I want you guys to be thinking about these ideas. What are we doing in the frequency domain? Uh, how are you choosing the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter? Uh, why are you multiplying the signal with the same carrier at the, uh, the, the receiver? What would happen if I change it? What would happen instead of, uh, if, when I do amplitude modulation here, I choose cosine 10t. But when I'm doing demodulation, I choose cosine 11t. What would happen then? You, instead, okay, so what would this look like? Instead of a triangle, what would it look like? It would look something like this, right? Some, something like that. Like the, the, the triangles will not go all the way to zero. They will just have like, like, like that, right? Like you will get an M kind of shape. So you're not gonna get the shape. You're not gonna get the signal, which is why they have to match in frequency at least. The effect of phase we'll look at in a different slide. All right, questions here? Good. Right before the phaser, can hmm. we convert it into a Absolutely, you can you can do it. So uh, depend because we'll we will never we will not always send the same signals. It'll be different, right? So depending on the signal your option of viewing the signal might might change. In general, if I'm just assuming M of omega, then in, just to track the process all the way down, it is easier for me to work in frequency domain just because of, uh, uh, hold on, this one, right? So, because I did not know what my message is, right? M of tau, M of tau. I needed to know that in close form mathematically in order to go to the next step. But if I, if I, I cannot assume this, but in terms of frequency, I can make an assumption, a triangle and so on. But because it, instead of a triangle, it might look something weird, but it will be band limited, right? Something like that, I cannot make for a M of tau. Like I, I, I just have M of tau. All right, let's take a look at the synchronization of local oscillators. I've got a one periodic signal, C of T, at use at the transmitter to modulate the signal, and one, another one, at look, as a local oscillator in the uh, receiver. Now, if they were both the same signal, then there is no point of communication at all, right? If this is coming from the same source, and this is coming from the same source, then the chances are that the, the, both the transmitter and the receiver are, the, are co-located, the same place. Then there's no need for communication. The idea is you're using the same local oscillator. Well, you're, you're using the same local, uh, uh, you're using a different local oscillator which has the same frequency and phase. Same frequency, easy to get. Same phase, extremely difficult. 
So you need some sort of a complicated receiver, which is based off of a phase lock loop, which essentially tracks the phase of a signal, right? So if the signal moves away, you sort of adjust to that and come to it. In an iterative loop by loop manner, you try to lock on to the phase of the incoming signal. What are we doing here? Say, same things, right? Same transmitter and receiver, same amplitude modulation going on. The message in this case has a high fre highest frequency of omega m. The cosine uh, carrier is at omega c. Omega c has to be much greater than omega m. Why is that? Why does the carrier frequency have to be much greater than the frequency of the message? Let us say that this guy is my, uh, my message, right? When I modulate it with a carrier whose frequency is less than omega m, what would happen? They overlap, right? You at least need this to go here, right? So your carrier frequency needs to be at least that. Well, if you just do this, then zero is right there. So you're not even going to the really, really high frequencies, to the microwave frequencies. That's why you go up, right? Now, when you go up, you see, suppose now you are going all the way up, right? Suppose your carrier is over here, say one gig in frequency F. If your carrier is at one gig, theoretically, how wide can your triangle be? Two gig, yeah? Like you can have it from here to here, right? Like two gig, yeah? Think light. When you think about light, you're talking about 192 terahertz. That's your carrier frequency. When you're going over there, think about how big, theoretically, your, your data can be, right? You guys see that? Your, your, so the higher you go in terms of a carrier frequency, you will be able to achieve that high of a data rate because the bandwidth will be that high. Now what you do is you don't modulate 100% of your carrier. You don't go one gig oh, all the way here, all the way there. You don't do that. You maybe modulate 10% of your carrier, right? You don't go all the way. But 10% of one gig will give you 0.1 gig. But 10% of 19.2 terahertz, uh, 19, 192 terahertz will give you 19.2 terahertz. Can I see that? Which is why you don't stop at RF frequencies. Now we talk about light communication. That's the reason. Like you're going for higher, you're changing the medium because you are able to get higher data rates depending on whether you're communicating using uh, RF or uh, light. Okay, so that's the reason why your omega C has to be much greater than omega M. Go ahead. Well, nobody else is going to be able to use any other thing in that, right? So what you want to do is you want to use carrier message, carrier message, carrier message. So you want to do frequency division multiplexing. You don't want to take the entire spectrum for, that's not, theoretically, sure, you can talk about it like just as an idea, but that's never a practical situation. You get a slice. Yep, so that's what I'm saying. Practically, you, you only have a very, very small slice. Even that small, remember, this is, for a communication systems engineer, there are several resources, power, space, time, and frequency. There are the four resources. I can multiplex in space, antenna, 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 antenna. I can multiplex in time, user one, go now, user two, go now, user three, go now. I can multiplex in power, low power, and then higher power, then higher power transmission. I can multiplex in frequency. User one, this slice. User two, user three, like the FM radio. The, the most expensive resource is frequency. So you never do like from here to there. Yes. Was that? <laughs> yes. All right, so let's let's continue here. Uh, we have got local oscillator, and we are trying to look at this, right? 
if you use cosine omega CT as a local oscillator in our transmitter, we will be able to match in frequency omega CT, but we will have a difficulty in matching with the phase, right? Frequency, fine, uh, frequency is fine, but phase is the problem. And then you can do the filtering and all that. Now let's take a look at the phase synchronization problem. What are the consequences of phase not being in sync? Uh, you guys agree with, uh, uh, you guys are, can, can see why they cannot be in sync, right? Yeah? A cosine signal is, is like continuous. You don't say time zero and then start sketching, right? Like that's not, that, it's a continuous signal. It's coming in periodic, it's all the, all the time. That's why it's difficult to maintain the phase. Now, um, V of T, which is the multiplication of M with a cosine. Now the second cosine it's getting multiplied with, with is theta has the theta term because that's the one that is used in the receiver. So you have M of T multiplied by two cosines. When you're multiplying two cosines, this is another trig identity that we will use a lot. Cosine A multiplied by cosine B, you get some frequency terms and you get different frequency terms. Amplitude scales by half. So you get half cosine sum and cosine difference. So the cosine sum frequency term will be at two omega CT plus theta. No problem. We can eliminate that using H of omega because the frequency is at two, two omega C. But this guy, cosine theta, that will go through, right? That is at uh, baseband, that will go through, that will be in the message. So you can get, reject this guy from the low pass filter, but not this. So what you will end up with is half M of T cosine theta where theta is the phase difference between the local oscillator and used at the transmitter with respect to the receiver, local oscillator. So you see, if theta is zero, it's perfect, half m of t. The local oscillators used are in sync, perfect, no problem. But if cosine is pi over two, p o of t is zero. So everything canceled out. So if you are, if you are using the same carrier, but it is out of phase by 90 degrees, you are in trouble. You don't get anything. Forget the message. You don't get anything. So to keep the fake signal, we should need a complicated receiver, which is essentially phase, phase using phase lock loops. Okay. We talked about this. All right. Let's talk about double sideband suppressed carrier modulation. There are lots of terms over here. Everything is straightforward. Suppressed carrier. What are you suppressing? You are suppressing the carrier. What does that mean? You're not transmitting the carrier. Why? It doesn't have any information. Where, the info, where is the information? It's in the message. So why should I transmit the carrier when the message is in the, I will send the modulated signal, but I'll not send the carrier. So I'll suppress the carrier so that there's no power associated with it. So this is an example where you have a suppressed carrier modulation. You're suppressing the carrier. You see, there's no carrier that you see here, right? If, you, if you, there was a carrier, you would have seen the carrier here and here, an impulse there and there. You don't see it. So it's a suppressed carrier modulation. What is double sideband? Well, if M of T is a message signal, and if M of T is real, what can you say about the Fourier transform of M of T? M of T is real. What, is, what can you say about M of omega? Symmetry, what type of symmetry? Hermitian symmetry, right? Conjugate symmetry. Conjugate symmetry means if it's real, then this is going to be the same as this, right? Is the same information. It is exactly the same information. I just have two copies of it. If it is at baseband, not a problem. These are positive frequencies that matter to me, but these are negative frequencies. At baseband, it doesn't matter to you. However, when you upconvert it because of multiplying by cosine, you have got twice the frequency that you are using, but you are really uh, sort of efficiently utilizing only half of it. You guys see that? Because only half of it is useful information. The other half is redundant. So you can either do upper sideband. This is called an upper sideband, highlighted in green. And these are called lower sidebands of the signal. Both combined, you have double sideband. Double sideband is not efficient in terms of 
how effectively it is able to use the bandwidth. I paid for all of this, two omega m, but I'm really using only this to increase my data rate. So the efficiency is not that great, right? What could I do? I could do single sideband carrier, a, a single sideband suppressed carrier, or single sideband. What is single sideband? One idea is, this is exactly the same as this, so I'll reject one of them. How? Use a band stop filter, right? Or band reject filter, what you guys, whatever you guys call it. So I'll chop this guy off. I will use this, and then I will use all of this for another uh, user, and so on, right? So I'll only do upper sideband transmission, or I can do only lower sideband transmission, and so on. Now, let's suppose if I do only upper sideband transmission, right? So I, I, I filtered out the lower sideband, for example. How would I be able to reconstruct my message? Exactly the same, right? If I multiply this guy with a cosine at omega c, this half comes here, and this half comes here, giving back my message. Do I see that? So I can, I, but if I do this, lower uh, if I do uh, lower sideband transmission, then I need to bring this over here, and I need to bring this over here. So I need to appropriately measure, multiply it with the uh, cosine signal. So I do crisscross, and then I've got my message. Low pass filter, extract. So double sideband is, you have both the upper sideband and the lower sideband, and you're trying to suppress the carrier. Uh, and we'll, I'll talk about in the time domain, what it means to suppress the carrier or not. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, uh. What are you doing in the receiver? You multiplied by the cosine here. You multiplied by the same cosine here, which means what? I am using a local oscillator to do synchronous demodulation. The moment you hear the term synchronous, you know that you are using a local oscillator in the receiver to multiply by the received signal. And then you, or this is also called coherent detection. And then you filter it out. This is more expensive, but performs much better than asynchronous detection. If asynchronous detection, you don't have a, you don't need the local oscillator. All you need is a envelope detector, which you can make using a diode followed by an RC filter. Chop off the lower half, charge, discharge, charge, discharge, charge, discharge, track the envelope. Did you have a question, Colin? Oh. All right, so let's see. That's what we are trying to look at next. So synchronous detection works really well, but there are a few problems. One, complicated receiver needs phase lock loop, needs local oscillator, needs a multiplier, which is you know adding to the noise floor. So let's take a look at an asynchronous on envelope detection. So this is an alternate to all of this, right? You're still using the same transmitter, but we want to replace this. How can we do that? By using a envelope detection. So this is what? A diode to do a half-wave rectification. Then you are charging and discharging C2 using this resistor R. You are using capacitor C3 to block DC, to remove the average of the signal, make it zero. And VB, the voltage over there, is going to be your output, your message, hopefully. So what are all the pieces here? This is assumed to be your transmitter. This is supposed to be a antenna in which you are tuning C1 so that it resonates with the signal that you transmitted, so that you pick up those frequencies. So what do you see at the input? So after you appropriately tune C1, you have your signal that you received, S of T, right? S of T looks something like this. This is the one that you transmitted, and hopefully you tuned your receiver antenna such that S of T is what you get, right? What are you left with? You are left with the process of extracting the message from this. But the constraint that you have added is, cannot use a local oscillator, cannot use a uh, synchronous detection. If you desire that, then you have to make sure that M of T is greater than or equal to zero. 
We talked about that. If m of t goes below zero, then you will have a phase reversal when you multiply m with a cosine. And because you, multi the, you have the phase reversal, the information is no longer in the uh, envelope, right? Like, so it will not go this way. It will go this and this, right? The envelope that you track will be of something else. So you have to make sure that m of t is greater than zero. What can you do to make sure of that? Well, if m of t was going below zero, you just add a bias to the message to bring it up. If you bring it up, you have added a bias, but you, you can make sure that, that it is always greater than zero. Now let's take a look at uh, some other things that are happening over here with envelope detection. We have assumed that the diode is ideal. The uh, current voltage characteristics are linear. We have assumed that. And if that is the case, uh, here, this is your homework problem that you guys just did or are doing, right? Something like this. In, uh, the, the input output relationship. What happens because of that? All the things that are positive go through, all the things that are negative get chopped off, right? So if S of T was the input to the diode, what would be the voltage at point A, VA? Well, it would be everything is the same, except we have chopped off all the negative half, right? Now you are using VA to charge C2 through R. So when you charge C2 through R, charge, discharge, charge, discharge, charge, discharge, and so on, right? So you're essentially tracking the black line, which is M of T, right? The red line is what is uh, getting closer and closer to the black line. Now tell me, if I wanted the red line to exactly match up with the black line, what things can I change here? Okay, so RC, right? So I can make sure that the capacitor, the RC2, the product is really big. The time constant is big, so the discharge rate is slower and slower. So it will give you a smoother uh, uh, change, so it will track M of T better. What else can I change? Increase carrier frequency. So you increase carrier frequency, you will be able to get uh, closer and closer to M of T, right? So increase carrier frequency or improve time constant. Now, once you have that, so you see the red signal is what you have at point uh, across C2. Then you're using C3 to block DC. You bring it down to zero. The average is brought down to zero. Remove DC term. That's your VB. VB is the detected version of the message. So message was what? Message was you know, some, something like this, right? Something like that whatever this is, like, like that. And you, we got red. You guys see that? Huh? So synchronous detection or coherent detection, you multiply filter. With asynchronous detection, no multiplication necessary. Just use simple diode resistor capacitor elements because all you need is the envelope of the carrier. You don't need anything else. So. Inexpensive, but doesn't perform well. Trade-off, performance versus cost. No need of phase lock loop, no need of local oscillator, no need of product multiplier, no need of filtering. All you need is to uh, do those few elements here. That's it. Next, modulation index. So how much power is being associated with the signal? How much power is associated with the carrier? If you had everything in your control, what would you prefer? Most of your signal, the, the power that you transmit, right? Through the antenna, you have to transmit a specific amount of power. That power has a power budget. Some of it is associated with the signal. Some of it will be associated with the carrier. How much of it do you want associated with the signal? All of it, right? So you want all of the transmitted power to be for the thing that you want to transmit, for the useful information. But because of uh, asynchronous detection, you may have to have some bias, some B, right? So you had to increase the level so that it is all above zero. Because of that, you introduce the carrier. Because of that, you have some carrier power that you need to transmit as well. Let's take a look. Modulation index, mu, is that ratio. Let's derive that. M of t is your message. And maybe it is going below zero, so you add a bias, cap B, to it, such that M of T is always greater than or equal to zero. So 
you know, something like this, right? If it is going here, whatever this point is, you are adding to it so that it is above zero. You're bringing it above zero. That's all you're doing. So that when you multiply it with a cosine, there's no phase reversal. So you add the bias, then you multiply with the cosine. That will be your transmitted signal. This is necessary only when you're doing asynchronous detection, not necessary when you're doing synchronous. So here, B of T, uh, sorry, B, which is the bias, plus M of T, you want that to be greater than or equal to zero. And you obviously have the cosine omega CT from the carrier. Now, if you want to choose B such that B of T, uh, B plus M of T has to be greater than or equal to zero. What you can say about B is it is greater than or equal to the absolute maximum value in M of T. So modulation index mu is essentially the ratio of the maximum value, the, the absolute maximum in um, M of T divided by the bias that you added to the signal. And it can be as small as zero, and it, it when the maximum value in the absolute of m of t is actually exactly equal to b, your modulation index is one. So mu ranges from zero to one. It is expressed as a percentage. When mu is greater than one, it is over modulation. So essentially, as you are increasing uh, mu, what are you changing? You see, b is the bias, right? And that, that is the maximum uh, signal, uh, maximum value in the signal. So if you have here, if you look at this, you can go as small as this, right? Or you can keep going up, right? And your carrier will be doing this, right? That's what you're changing with the mu. You see that? Mu one greater than, uh, okay. So let, let's try to take an example here. Suppose that the message that we are trying to transmit is a very simple cosine. Cosine uh, omega mt, omega m corresponding to a message, and you have some k as your constant. That is the signal that you are trying to transmit. Uh, S of t, the transmitted message, is some bias that has been added to m of t to make it greater than or equal to zero, multiplied by the cosine carrier, cosine omega ct. Mu from before is the ratio of the maximum value in M of T divided by B. The maximum value in M of T is what? The absolute of this guy will just give you K. So mu is K divided by B in this example. Let's try to look at it in frequency domain. For M of T, the Fourier transform is M of omega. What is the Fourier transform here? Omega M will give you omega M and minus omega M. If the amplitude was one, this would be pi and pi. The amplitude is k, so this will be pi k and pi k. Next, for S of t, what do you have? S of t has, let's write this. S of t, you can write as uh, b cosine omega ct plus m of t cosine omega ct, right? b cosine omega ct is giving you this and this. And the next one, M of T cosine omega CT is giving you that, 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 and that. Why? Because M of T has two, imp uh, two impulses. When you multiply it by the two impulses of the cosine, going up and going down, right? Resulting in four of them. You guys see that? All right. So that is what you're transmitting. Uh, let me, let's see. All right. So at 100% modulation, that means that the modulation index is one. What do you have? k equals b, right? So mu was k divided by b. Mu equals one means k divided by b equals one. That means b equals k. The bias that we are choosing exactly matches the amplitude of the message. So what would be the signal? What would be the carrier? Well, the signal would be the same, right? k omega mt. The power would be what? The power would be k squared. How about the carrier? The carrier is here and here. By the way, this is suppressed carrier transmission or uh, not suppressed carrier transmission? Do you see the carrier here or not? Yes, I see it here and I see it here. 
if I didn't see it, if I just saw this, 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 and this, I would have called it suppressed carrier. But because I see the carrier, which is coming from what? It is coming from this guy, right? The B, the bias. So because you want to go from async, you want to go for asynchronous, uh, a, a, a relatively inexpensive and simple receiver, you can do this. You can add the bias, but the problem is because you added the bias, there is going to be some power associated with it. You see that? So let's see how much power. Carrier signal is what? K, which is B, omega CT, right? So amplitude is B present at omega C. So that is K omega CT. That's your carrier signal. The power of this guy is going to be K squared. So K squared for the signal, K squared for the carrier, that means your signal power is exactly the same as carrier power. Pretty poor, right? At 100% modulation, what this means is you have the same amount of power going for the signal as the carrier. So half of the power budget is for the carrier, which is not such a good news. So let's see what happens when you go for 50% modulation. 50% modulation means mu, that ratio is half. If it is half, we know that mu is k divided by b. If it is half, then we know b equals 2k. If b equals 2k, our signal power is still k squared. That didn't change. Uh, but our carrier power changed from, uh, it's now uh, 2k squared, right? So car carrier amplitude is b. The power is b squared. b squared is now 2k whole squared, which is 4k squared. So for 4k squared, what can you say about signal power and carrier, carrier power? k squared for signal, 4k squared for carrier. That means signal power is 25%, one quarter of carrier power, which is good news or bad news? Which is really bad news, right? We're really bad news. So my, the power that I'm associating with the signal is just a quarter of how much I'm associating with the carrier. All of this to say that if you want to use amplitude modulation and uh, asynchronous detection at my receiver, the best I can do is half and half. Signal power equals carrier power. That's the best I can do. Right? That, so this is sort of the best case scenario if I want to do asynchronous detection. Um, we try to keep mu at as close to 100 as possible, 90, 95%. That's where we try to keep it. All right, how are we doing? Okay, we will continue. This is going to be really interesting. So I want you guys to sort of tune in. <laughs> Get it? All right, so next topic is tuned radio frequency. Um, why are we using this? Uh, we want to use bandpass filters to extract our message which is going to be pretty straightforward, right? My signal is at that this particular frequency. All right, let's design a bandpass filter that is at that frequency. Extract it. All you need to do is down convert it to zero, which you can do using uh, any sort of product multiplier. Bring it down to zero, and that's your message. But the problem is this. You will need to tune it. Why do you need to tune it? Because sometimes the message is here, sometimes the message is here, sometimes the message is here, it changes, right? So what do you need to design is a tuned filter. What is the problem when you design tuned filters? Well, whenever you are thinking about filters, you think about two aspects of filter design. One is how selective it is. What is a very, very good selective filter? Ideal filter, sharp cutoff, right? That's denoting the selectivity of a filter. So if this guy, which is a bandpass filter, if this was very, very selective, then it would look more like a rectangle, right? That is one aspect of filters. The other aspect is what? Tunability. Can I move this particular filter up and down? Can I tune it to different resonant frequencies? What do I need to do to change the resonant frequency of a filter? Else, uh, LC, right? So I, I need to change the values of L and C such that omega R for this particular uh, LC bandpass filter is one divided by square root LC. So by changing the values of L and C, 
what do I do? I change where the bandpass filter is, right? I can tune it. So then now the next question is, if there are two aspects to filter design, which is tunability and selectivity, can I get a really, really good, can I get a highly selective filter that is really tunable? Can I get it? All right, so here. Uh, I need you guys to sort of dig into your circuits uh, discussion at the very end, maybe, with the filters. How many order filter is this? Second order? If I wanted, if I wanted ID selective filters, increase the order, right? So I have more such sections, right? LC, LC, LC. And I can do that in P section, and I can do that in pi section. Making sense? Yeah? I can add more and more LNCs, right? I get a very, very high, highly selective filter in that case. Yeah? Now think about tuning it. When you want to tune it, you have to tune all the L's and C's so that it moves. Very, very difficult to do that. You guys see that? So if the, a filter is highly selective, then it is really coarse in terms of its tunability. But if it is really tunable, like this guy is with the second order, it will be not as selective. Selectivity and tunability are conflicting. You cannot get both. You can get one. You have to sacrifice the other. Do I see that? So what do we do? What do we do if we want both? As users, we want both, right? We want it to be tunable, and we want it to be highly selective. So how do we do? The idea to that is provided by super heterodyne filter, which is also called as Armstrong filter, which is basically the idea is, let us do coarse tunability first. So let's have a very coarse, not so selective, but core, uh, tunable, right? So tunability is good, but it is select, not that selective. Let's do that first. And then let us multiply that signal, which, is, which has been coarsely uh, filtered. Uh, sorry, it was tuned, but it was not highly selective. You multiply it with a carrier such that the output falls exactly in the same frequency as uh, my very highly uh, selective filter. So, so I do it in two stages. One is I will use a um, tunable but not that selective filter first. Then I will multiply the signal such that the result falls exactly at a frequency where I'm going to employ a highly selective filter. So I'll do the filtering in two stages. That's how I get best of both worlds. And that's where we are going with this, but we are out of time. So we'll talk about this discussion uh, when we come back on Thursday? Yeah, Thursday. So Thursday, we'll uh, wrap up this discussion. We'll start our discussion on sampling. Exam one coming up Monday of next week. What? Exam two coming up Monday of next week. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Exam two, exam two will have, yeah. Because it's still one, one week away, right? All right, let me stop the recording here.